ask that you will forgive us today of our sins. Lord God, give us cleansing, Lord God, through your blood tonight. Help us to have a spirit of forgiveness toward others. We pray, Lord God, that you would be exalted in our midst tonight. Let your praises ring forth tonight. We pray that you would be honored in each of our lives. Your name shall forever be praised and magnified through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. And again, we greet everybody in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a blessing to us to be able to assemble in the Lord's house. And I was thinking that just over the last few days with so much that has happened and is happening, and we've even made these statements before like this, we never know when we may be gathering for the last time. But that has never become more of a reality than where we are right now. On a daily basis, you can take nothing for granted. You cannot take your own life for granted. You sure cannot take other people for granted. While we yet live, move, and have our being in the Lord, we should do our best to live the best way that we possibly can. We should all do our best to live right. And the things that are important for us to do, it is important that we do it while we have time. So I'm thanking God that he's faithful and he's merciful and he's gracious to each and every one of us. Want to also welcome those that are tuned in to our service tonight and pray that together in the word of the Lord, each of us will be blessed. We have a very profound lesson that I feel that God has brought at this specific time given the fact that we are living in the last days. I want to call your attention to the book of Jude. I want to speak to us tonight about our most holy faith. I want to speak to us tonight again about our most holy faith. This is such a profound book and it is a profound lesson and I will tell you it is even timely for us and in the days ahead I believe God is going to reveal to us how timely his word is. One of the things I say so very often in speaking and striving to represent God is that God's word is always ahead of us. Our lesson tonight that is one of the things that will be pointed out as we go into this lesson again. One more time, our, our subject matter tonight, what we're dealing with, the what? Our most holy faith. The book of Jude tonight. There are several things tonight, and maybe more than several, approximately 12 things that I want to make points about as we deal with an expository, expository approach to the lesson of our most holy faith. But beginning from verse number one, if everybody has it, I'd like to ask us to read aloud together. Read. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. All right? Point number one, and I, I want you to keep up uh, with me here tonight, and this is the introduction. Uh, so I want us to get whatever we can get when God brings it to us. It is important in these latter times to understand the state of the true minister of Jesus Christ. The state of the true minister of Jesus Christ. Ministry today is 
really in danger of a lot of deception because men have taken on the ministry to be and to mean something other than what the Lord Jesus Christ intended for it to be. You will notice in verse number one, Jude is the servant of Jesus Christ. This Jude here, there were several people that bore the name Jude or Judas. Uh, in the compiling of the scriptures, especially in the translation, some of the writers of the, the Greek text uh, felt it necessary to distinguish between Judas Iscariot, who we know betrayed Jesus. Is that right? And uh, there were others, again, that bore that same name. But when it came to Jude here in this letter, in this epistle, uh, one of the reasons for uh, this rendering of his name was to make sure it was clear that we were not talking about Judas Iscariot. So you have uh, the rendering of the name as Jude. But please notice he is referred to as the servant of Jesus Christ. This Jude was actually the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh. Actually, he was considered a half-brother and a half-brother from the standpoint is that Jesus is the only begotten son of God. Therefore, Joseph, uh, being his natural guardian father on earth, um, Jesus was not the biological son of Joseph. So after Jesus comes on the scene, Mary and Joseph, of course, they have other children born into the family, so he is often referred to from a historical standpoint as the half-brother of Jesus Christ. So not too uh, important uh, for us to dwell on that particular fact in history. Uh, it is important for us to understand, oftentimes when we are under, trying to seek biblical understanding of people, places, and or Things Because of the fact that they are representing the Lord in such a position. So James, uh, Jude rather, uh, does not make Jesus common and he does not look upon Jesus just in the realm of the flesh. I will submit to you that few people possess the ability to draw lines. When it comes to family relationship, many people have the inability or they lack the inability uh, to be able to draw the line, the spiritual connection from the natural connection. Do you remember during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ? Jesus was speaking on one occasion and somebody came, he was inside of the house and Somebody came and said, Lord, your, your mother and your brother are outside, are outside wishing to speak to thee. And Jesus said something that would probably offend a lot of people. He says to the person that came and told him that, he said, who is my mother and who are my brethren? He turned him about and looked on those that were there in his presence to hear the word that he was speaking. And he said, behold, these are my brethren. This is my mother for he that doeth the will of God. Listen to this. You got you to gotta climb up to a spiritual level to get this. He said, those that do the will of my father, which is in heaven, they are my mother and my brethren. It seems then, when you get down to Jude, now Jude in the beginning and his brother, and they had a problem with Jesus in his earthly ministry, and I don't want to label the point, they really had a problem with, with him because 
They just looked up here, you just our brother. But now after James gets converted, and he got converted, of course, on the day of Pentecost. He's right there, if you read in Acts chapter number one, and they're all in the upper room. James, the brother of Jesus Christ, in fact, Luke points out in the book of Acts that in that 120 approximate number that was there, there was Mary and there was the brethren of Jesus. In other words, he had some family members that had gotten converted. And I will submit here tonight that it makes all the difference in the world when you get saved. Oh, Lord, help me here tonight. The relationship you have with people, it would be like Paul said in one place, that from henceforth know we no man henceforth after the flesh. There comes a point when we get saved, when we're born again, when we get spirit filled, that we have to be able to see and operate beyond the realm of the flesh. Now hold on to that. That'll bless you in your own walk with God. No matter how you have relationship with people otherwise, the Holy Ghost makes the difference. In the case of Jesus, even though Jude was a brother, had he not seen Jesus beyond the realm of the flesh, it may actually have hindered him from getting saved. Not only from getting saved, it may have actually hindered him from being saved. So this is very, very important when you, you read the book of Jude. This is actually the brother. But Jude refers to himself as the servant of Jesus Christ. Now as a brother, he could easily develop a fleshly attitude. He ain't no better than me. He's just a brother. He ain't no more, he ain't no less, but he certainly ain't no more. But because of Jude being able to rise to a spiritual level, he dismissed the fact that he was even a brother at all. He dismissed any kind of natural relationship. He simply looks upon Jesus though he's his blood brother, though he is his brother in the flesh, he, he humbles himself and refers to himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. So now the first point again becomes the state of the true minister of Jesus Christ. By this time, Jude is a servant and a minister of Jesus Christ. So the true state of the minister of Jesus Christ is one of a servant. A true minister is never to be looked upon. He is not to look upon himself and neither should he be looked upon as the master. He is referred to as the servant, and he's not the only one that refers to himself as a servant. James does it, and some of the other apostles refer to themselves as that as well, because that's what a minister is. A, a true minister is a servant. A true minister is not one that makes all his focus become centered on being served. The true minister focuses on actually serving. So this is very, very, very powerful and very noteworthy as we come into the text. The next part of verse one, it takes us to point number two. Point number one again being the state of the true minister of Jesus Christ. Our second point tonight is the state of the true believer. You will notice thus far I am placing emphasis on the word true. There are ministers by the thousands all over the world. And there are so-called believers 
by the thousands and by the millions all over the world. Unfortunately, not all of those who are ministers are true ministers of Jesus Christ. And as it relates to uh, the people as a whole, unfortunately, not all that are called believers are true believers. So my emphasis tonight is the state of the true minister of Jesus Christ. And that is that he is a servant of Jesus Christ. Number two, the state of the true believer. Notice the second part of verse one. To them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Now, Tonight, we're, we're going to deal with our most holy faith, and we'll, we'll get in that momentarily, what we're actually talking about when we're talking about our most holy faith. But when we look at to whom Jude is writing, it is to them that are sanctified. It seems that God has uh, actually placed emphasis on this word within the last couple of weeks as I have taught. What does it mean to be sanctified? Help me out. Just a minute here. This is not a hard question, but what does it mean? Sister D. Barry, help me out. Separated. To be sanctified means to be separated. Now, there's a serious need why Jude is writing, and we're going to pick that up. But one of the things that have fallen upon hard times, even within the visible church, is our need to be sanctified. You will have to say amen. It still is true anyhow. It has fallen upon hard times all over the world. There is now, in the end time, little difference between the church and the world, whether we care to admit it or not. Being sanctified, being separated is almost a thing of the past. Just look at it with me for yourself. If you're going to be truly saved today, I pray God will help us tonight. If you're going to be truly saved in the last days to the point that you end up making it, you're going to have to have a made up mind. You're going to have to be, Sister D. Bear, what's that you say? You're going to have to be intentional. That's the word. If you're going to be saved, it's going to have to be that you're trying to be saved. Because in the visible church of today, this, this letter here, is designed to be a wake up. It's designed to be a clarion call. It's really a military call. It is the sounding of a trumpet so that the people of God do not sleep so that we are not really placed in the, the area of ignorance and deception as to really what is going on. When we look at to them that are sanctified, Jude is being specific. Brothers and sisters, everybody look this way as I tell you, it has become necessary for us to be specific with whom we're addressing. I want you to hold on to that. It has become necessary for us to become specific. Everybody at large will not receive the word of God. Sound like I said something. God already knows that there are those who will fail to be sanctified. He doesn't stop at being sanctified. He says to them that are sanctified by God, the Father. So we're not talking about people that's just going their own way, doing their own thing. We're talk, not talking about just falling uh, or to man-made ideals. We're talking about sanctified by God the Father. 
Notice it says, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Now, we're talking about the state of the true believer. The state of a true believer is that a true believer is one that is sanctified. Again, by God the Father. It's one that lives separated from the world. Secondly, a true believer is one that is preserved. The word preserved, another word for this word would be one that is kept or guarded. Kept or guarded in Jesus Christ. Now, you may not mind taking a pen or a highlighter and underline in Jesus Christ. Everything here about the true state of a believer is not by his or her own accord. Being sanctified is not by my own idea of being sanctified. I'm sanctified by God the Father. He has separated me. And I think when we were in Peter last week, Peter even talked about through sanctification of the Spirit. Y'all remember that last week? See, that's why the scripture said we ought to give the more earnestly to the things which we have heard. You know what? You and I got to give heed to not just the word that's coming, but you got to give heed to that that you've already heard. Well, you got to process that a minute so you don't miss the text. What we got to be obedient to is the word that's already been preached the word that have already been taught. God wants the word to actually take root in our lives because the only word that does us any good is the word that goes on the inside. Matthew chapter 13 is a good read to understand the reality of different types of people because the word goes forth. Y'all still looking this way? Because the word goes forth, that don't mean everybody's receiving it the way they need to. Matthew 13 tells us there are at least four different types of hearers. Do not ever feel, oh, this will help us in our dealing with people. It will even deal, help us in our dealing with understanding what happens in the church. Why does it look like a group of people can be in the church? Look like they kind of been in church the same length of time. They sit under the same ministry. But it seemed like some are able to progress and develop and grow and it looked like others are stunned or they don't grow at all. The word of God gives you to understand it. Everybody is not, I hope this will help you, I hope you let this dwell with you. Everybody regardless to amount of years that they are in church or around the church. Everybody is not receiving the word of God the same. They may be hearing the word, but they're not hearing the same. That's another lesson for another time, maybe coming a little bit down the road. So Jude writes to them that are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ, Please notice the last clause in verse one says what? And what? It is the apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter four. He writes to the believers there saying, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Called. We have to cherish and we have to value our calling. And when I talk about calling, one of the things that we have need of in the church is to have a deeper understanding of the calling of God beyond the pulpit and the call to preach. There is in the scripture what is called the call to holiness. He have called us unto holiness. Everybody say holiness. holiness. Mm -hmm. So everybody that is a true believer has a calling. 
And we are admonished in the scriptures to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. The word walk is an action term. It's a word that denotes the way you live. We are to live in respect to our calling. We are to live with respect to our calling. We are to live as the children of God who are living with an appreciation and a level of respect to the call of God on our lives. Amen? So this becomes the true state of the believer. What is that again? Sanctified, by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Now, how many of you tonight thank God for the keeping power? Now, I'll, I'll tell you now, I can stay there the rest of the night. Preserve. Somebody help me with that word, preserve. What does it mean to be preserved? Mm, Sister Bean? To be kept? Come on, talk to me further. What does it mean to be preserved? Some of you that know anything about cooking. What are, what, what is to be understood about being preserved? Sister Brown? to be brought to the state of no ruin. Yes, ma'am. Sister Jamira? To be made to last. Sister Parts? Preserving and keeping something in its natural state preserved in Jesus Christ. Jude and Peter are similar in a lot of their language and a lot of the things that they are conveying as they are both moved by the Holy Ghost. Because it was Peter that says to the believers that we are kept by the power of God. How many of you all can give God praise tonight and just say, I thank God that I'm kept by the power of of God. I'm not kept by my own strength. I'm not kept by my own might. I'm not kept by any skill of my own. Come on, give God great praise right now. I'm kept by the power of God. Now with Jude, he's, placed, he's placing the emphasis where the emphasis needs to be placed. Preserved in Jesus Christ. Outside of Jesus Christ, I do not have what it takes to keep me from going to ruin. Outside, if it was not for Jesus Christ and him giving me a place in him, my mind would already be ruined. My spirit would already be ruined and my whole life would already be ruined if it were not for Jesus Christ. I said, how many of y'all, that's your testimony tonight. I know who's keeping me. I am preserved in Jesus Christ and I'm called. I'm called. His call is upon me. Point number three, there is always in each of the epistles a salutation and a greeting that offers a heavenly bestowal or a heavenly blessing within the greeting. Notice what Jude says in verse two, let's read. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Now, I want you to get a scope right now in your mind and if you that know the Bible decently, especially the epistles, what is a little different in this salutation than what you read in some of the other epistles? Let's see if anybody catches it. All right, Sister Kathy. All right, she said, peace, then mercy. Anybody else notice anything? 
Normally in the epistles, you will see where whoever the writer is is saying grace and peace. Ah, but notice when we get to Jude, he said mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. And so let's talk about mercy. Since there's no mentioning of grace here, what are we to understand? What is mercy? What is mercy? What is mercy? Praise God. You know, watch this. And ain't nothing wrong with grace because we're saved by grace. And grace deals with the favor of God. But let me tell y'all something. I need to be teaching that too. Because grace, oh, we're going to pick it up in, in the lesson tonight. But grace is something that has been watered down and diluted also. It has been reduced to something less than what God actually made it to be. But notice here, in Jews' writing, we have mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Help me out, somebody. What is mercy? Mercy. Sister Kathy? Withholding of due punishment. You trying to help me out, Sister B? All right, good. Withholding of due punishment. Anybody else? Mercy. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endure forever. I think sometimes in the church we need to spend more time focusing on the mercy of God since there is so much reference to the mercy of God. Anybody else? What are we talking about? We're talking about mercy, Sister Brown? Not giving us what we actually deserve. Oh, Thomas? Compassion and forgiveness. Y'all talking good. That's good. Anybody else? Mercy. You see, whenever there is so much reference to any particular word in the scripture, that means we need to make sure that we have an understanding of the meaning. Uh, because God is not talking to hear himself talk. There's something that he wants us to know, something he wants us to learn. Praise the Lord. Mercy unto you. Now, given the context, and that's good, everything that you all said about mercy, but given the context of what Jane, Jude rather is about to go into, He's saying that for everything that God is going to do or is doing for his people, God is not doing it because you live good enough. I'm very serious when I tell you I feel like praising the Lord and I can quit right here and just go to giving God praise for the mercy. Anything, can I talk to you tonight? Anything that God chooses to do in your life, he's not doing it because you live good enough for him to do it. Whether he does it for your mind, for your spirit, for your body, for your family, for your finance, Anything that God is doing that he wants it understood. God would rather have mercy upon you than to have judgment put upon you. Woo. Even though I deserve the judgment, mercy is the withholding of what I do deserve. The mercy that God gives is God's way of saying, I would rather be compassionate and forgive you of your wrong than to send you to hell because you did wrong. 
Can we have church on this Wednesday night? How many of you will just think and consider with me any wrong that you've ever been guilty of? And just consider with me tonight. I think of me, you think of you. We ain't got to look at nobody else but ourselves. Here's the thought. What if God chose to hold any one thing that I've done wrong against me? Uh, if you're like me, when I think about it, I've been guilty of more than one thing. But how many of you know, Kamoshia, glory to God. How many of us know that any one thing we've been guilty of is enough to have sent us to hell? You, you need only to study the Old Testament to understand that God was showing to us in the days of old how displeased he is with sin. It didn't take them five times doing a thing wrong. It didn't take them 15 times doing it wrong. Many times just one thing because we must understand that in the Old Testament, God was laying out a pattern of holiness. Everybody say pattern of holiness. That's why Paul said, that the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. This is a thing that ought to put humility in every one of our spirits because I'm not sitting up in here. I don't have no place in God because I deserve it. Neither do I have the right to look down upon anybody else, even if I think I know something about them. Can I help all of us here tonight? God knows a whole lot about every one of us. No big eyes in here, not in the church of God. No little use in here in the church of God. Once again, from the Old Testament, God spoke through the prophet to let us know all flesh is as grass. What did he say? All flesh. Come on, everybody shout all flesh. And whenever you want to be in proper perspective, whenever you really want to be right in the sight of God, the way that you get right in the sight of God is in light of his word. It is the apostle Paul that said, in me, that is in my flesh, I don't even have to spend time focusing on nobody else. Paul said, in me, can y'all help me here tonight? Everybody say in me. That is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Can I go further? There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Why didn't they add that verse to no, not one? <laughs> There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Paul, the apostle, in the book of Romans, all have sinned. Come on, help me with the word. All have sinned. Who have sinned? He did. She did. They did. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. You want to be properly focused? You got to get it in the light of the word and say, all have sinned. You know why you say all? Because that includes me. I said it includes me. And were it not for the grace of God. God Almighty. Were it not for the grace of God. I'd have no eternal inheritance at all. I wouldn't have eternal life. 
would have no place in the church. How many of you are glad you're in the church tonight? You're part of the royal family, but not by your own goodness. Mercy unto you. In case anybody is feeling like I'm not so good in my life, Lord, I feel like having church, y'all. How many of y'all have days sometime that you feel that way? I'm not so good. I have some issues. I ain't talking about even if you ain't saying it, you know you're thinking it and feeling it. How many of you have days where you don't even feel like you're quite saved? Praise the Lord. Sometimes the way I was thinking through the day, sometimes the attitude that I had on a given day, sometimes giving in to certain weaknesses. Somebody shout hallelujah in the house. What are you saying? Mercy unto you. Do not ever think that your place in God is ever hinged on you. Do not ever feel that your goodness is enough to earn you the right to anything from God. So now, different from grace, is mercy. I, I should always, in my relationship with God, and in respect to being saved, I should always realize that God did not, oh God, there it is, Psalm 103. He has not dealt with us after I sin. Anybody ever read that verse in the Bible? He have not. What are you talking about? Mercy. He should have dealt with me. But he have not dealt with me. The psalmist said he have not dealt with us after our sins, God Almighty. Lord have mercy. Sometimes in my prayer, that verse will frequently come up and I'll find myself saying, Lord, thank you. I tell that you have not dealt with me after my sins. I wish I had a church here. I wish I had a church on Wednesday night where you could look up right now and say, Lord, thank you that you have not dealt with me after my sins. You have not rewarded me according to mine iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, woo. tell somebody that's really far. East and west, they are diametrically going in opposite directions. And God said, that's how far I remove your transgressions. He come out. Glory to God. In other words, I don't even want to see it. I wish I could have some church up in here. In other words, everybody repeat after me. Out of sight, out of mind. God said, that's where I want your sins to be. Totally out of my sight. I really don't want to even look upon you. We're in a remembrance of your sins. We're in a remembrance of your errors or your mistakes. Praise God. Praise God. Come on. Let's give him praise, y'all. Whoever's conducting service, I do it. And whoever's conducting service, we, we sometimes remind the people of God the scripture, he inhabits the praise of his people. Now watch this. So it's Wednesday night. But I don't want us to just think that that's just something fancy to say when we're up here. I do want us to understand God really does inhabit the praises of his people. You know what I'm glad about? It don't make no difference what day it is. Watch God. I dare you to give God praise again. Come on, everybody give God praise for his mercy. For his mercy. I'm a child of mercy. I'm a product of mercy. You know what? 
Satan is an accuser of the brethren night and day. Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost tells me that the devil been trying to make some of us feel like we ain't really so saved. But let me talk to you about being saved. Being saved is never by your own power to start with. See, see, that's the thing that God wants us to understand so, so that we're not struggling with being saved unnecessarily because we ought to understand that salvation is not by our works of righteousness. Talk to me, Paul, Titus chapter three, not according to our works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his abundant mercy. He saved us. Look out, somebody. Look at somebody and say, the Lord, he saved me. Oh, y'all got y'all to gotta, y'all, y'all gotta really let that really register. He saved me. What does it mean to be saved? He rescued me. What does it mean to be saved? It doesn't mean just going through a ceremony of baptism. It doesn't mean just to be down at the altar doing hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. It means he delivered me. He brought me out. Lord, I feel like singing now. He brought me out of the miry clay. Set my feet on the rock to stay. He has put a new song in my soul today. A song of gloom. A song of the blues a song of defeat. No, when I sing, I'm singing a song of praise. Hallelujah. Come on, shout hallelujah. The true state of the believer. And then when it comes to mercy, peace, and love, these are virtues, heavenly virtues that God does not want added He wants multiplied. Don't ever feel that your situation is too deep for the mercy of God. Somebody shout glory. Did you hear what I said? Do not ever feel like your situation is too deep for the mercy of God. You see, the real devil knows how to put that invisible question mark on top of your head. That on the surface, I know that God is a merciful God. I know he's a forgiving God, but I don't know. And you doubt your relationship with God because you tend to focus on things I have done and things that have not been so right in my life. Mercy under you and peace and love be multiplied. I don't know, Sister Ayanna, see, I don't know, see. I don't know that we're going to get to number 12. Praise the Lord. It'll be all right, just whatever the Lord helps us with tonight, right? It'll be all right. Praise God. Mercy unto you. The next thing is what? Peace. Now, we know peace is one of the things that we often are greeted with in the epistles. It is one of the virtues. It is one of the heavenly blessings bestowed upon the church. It is to them that are sanctified, preserved in Jesus Christ and called. If there's anybody that God wants to be a recipient of his grace, of his mercy, of his peace, and of his love, it is to them that are sanctified. Preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Praise the Lord. So the third point is mercy, peace, and love is to be multiplied. Number four, let's read verse number three now. Praise the Lord. Verse three, read. Beloved, when I gave all diligence, yes, to write unto you, of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you 
that you should earnestly contend for the, the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, what's our topic tonight? Our most holy faith. Now, we picked that up toward the end of Jude's writing. So I want you to understand what Jude is really building here for us to gain within our minds and in our understanding. So early on in the chapter, to build the message that he has from God to give to the church. He says that we should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Notice the term beloved. God never wants his people to forget who they are in him. Look at somebody and just, just look at them seriously and just say, be loved. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, just, just be loved. Yeah, don't, don't just embrace who hates you, who don't like you. Yeah, just be loved. Sometimes it's refreshing just to know he loves me. Lord have mercy. Be loved. When I gave all diligence, in other words, I didn't haphazardly write unto you. I did. This gets us back to the point number one, the true state, uh, the state of the true minister. Uh, a, a true minister is not haphazardly trying to speak to God's people. A true minister is trying to be diligent, careful to give the people of God what they need from God. Listen, let me make a confession here. There is absolutely no way on any given day I can give to you what you need. There's a simple reason for that. I do not know what you need. Praise the Lord. Sometimes we can think that we know what we don't know. I think it's Pastor Kermit DeLashmet. He was here the other week and we were talking and he said something uh, that's profound. I told him, I said, I'm going to quote you then. He said, all right, go ahead. He said, he said, here's what we know. That is that we don't know what we think we know. And that's what we know. <laughs> Praise God. When we think we know, Apostle Paul said, if any man among you thinketh that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know it. Whew. Umbling. 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 Love. Jude said, I didn't haphazardly write unto you, but I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. He said, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you and admonish you and encourage you that ye should earnestly contend. Somebody help me with that word, earnestly. What does it mean to be earnest? Don't everybody speak at once? What does it mean to be earnest? Big Freeland? Sincere. The word earnest really is a word that speaks of the degree of effort and attitude. When I gave all diligence right unto you, of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should not barely contend, but earnestly, I want you to stay with the lesson, contend for the what? For the faith, which was what? Now, when he makes reference to the faith, he's not talking about faith in a broad sense. He's talking about the set of doctrinal principles that we have been given. That becomes the faith. 
for us as believers to live on as in our foundation. Remember in Hebrews chapter number six, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us do what? Go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation and he lists those principles of repentance from dead works, uh, of uh, faith toward God, doctrine of baptism, laying on of hands, uh, and of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. He, he deals with the principles. All of that becomes foundation upon which we build. That becomes the faith once delivered unto the saints, all right? So point number four is we must contend. The word contend is we must struggle. We must persevere. We must become militant spiritually when it comes to the faith. We're in a day and a time now, brothers and sisters, that apostolic doctrine is a thing that many people are ignorant of. In other words, we have to be careful that we are not becoming ignorant for what we believe. I'm going to say it again. We must be careful that we are not becoming, I'm talking about the visible church of today. In the last days, we are ignorant as to what we believe. Because the enemy, as I'm about to show you in the text, is determined to water down. I, I really want you to listen to me. The enemy in the last days is determined to water down and dilute the faith, the faith, to where you won't even know what we're supposed to stand for unless you become a fighter, unless you become a soldier in the army of the Lord. We've got to become militant in these last days. Now, Paul said in his letter to Timothy that he was encouraging him even from a pastoral point, but all scriptures given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine. That being the case, then I want to mention that verse that he had stated that to Timothy, and that was fight the good fight of faith. Now, I'm not talking about go out and bloody nobody's nose. I'm not talking about go bust somebody in the mouth. I'm not talking about your physical fight because we're not really wrestling against flesh and blood. Come on, somebody. So we study the scriptures very carefully. When we're talking about fighting in the Lord, we're talking about spiritual warfare. Everybody say spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare means that we've got to fight the good fight of faith. So we've got to contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. All right? Now, verse 4, read. We're not going to get all the way through this tonight, but verse number 4, read. There are certain men crept in unawares. Now, this phrase here, I wish we had the Greek text, but this phrase here means there are men who are secretly invading the church. In the last days, there are certain men crept in unaware. In other words, they have not come through the door right. They have crept in. They have slipped in. They have secretly and connivingly positioned themselves and maneuvered themselves in a way to where they end up being among true believers. Jesus made us aware in the kingdom parables, one of which was the parable of the wheat and the tare. And in a study of wheat and tare, I will tell you that wheat and tare look very similar in the field. Ooh. 
Honorable Bishop Benjamin Carter did a wonderful thesis on that in Miami Gardens, Florida some few years back. And he said one of the things that he found out about wheat and tear, and you may hold on to this because it'll help you to be able to gain a spiritual truth. Wheat and tear look just alike when they're out in the field. That's why Jesus had to tell them, let them alone, lest you uproot the wheat along with the tear. He said, let them alone, and that might come out of the separation. Bishop Benjamin Carter said that when you look literally at wheat and tear, just before harvest, the wheat will bend at the top. But the tear never does. People that are really true and genuine in their relation with God will humble themselves. Praise God. And so that's where the difference is made. Certain men have crept in unaware, watch this, who were what? Before, of old. Now, everybody look this way because it's important that you don't misinterpret the meaning of the scripture. It don't mean that God ordained people to do wrong. God, the foreknowledge of God, already knew the ungodliness that would be in the latter days, so he already preset condemnation to the ungodliness. That's why he set the order of man in Genesis chapter 1. Before man ever sinned, are y'all listening to me? This is doctrinal truth. God don't make nobody do wrong, but God sets his order and the consequences ahead of time. Notice what the Lord said. I'm gonna hit this point. Hopefully you'll get it. The tree that is in the midst of the garden of, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou mayest not eat of it, for in the day, this is beforehand, in the day that you eat thereof, what? So before man ever sinned, God already had condemned sin. Isn't that something about God? God already knows the tendency of man ahead of time. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. God already knew, so he didn't wait till the end time to put condemnation on sin. What kind of men, Jude, were these that crept in? Talk to me. Ungodly men, yes. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God. Now, I'm gonna get ready to stop right here It'll be because uh, there's too much lesson. There's too much lesson for tonight. It's too much lesson. So the fifth point, and I'm gonna cut it off right here because we got 12 points to make in this text. But the fifth point is beware of ungodly men. Beware of ungodly men. Now, there is a sense that when you look at ungodly, it can suggest that they may be people who once were godly. You got to watch whenever there are people around you that want to tear down the godly life. There are men that have crept in in the latter days that promote more ungodliness. Now, where are these ungodly men? Not in the world. Not in the world. We're talking about the certain men that have crept in in the church. There are ungodly men who have crept in the church. I'm giving you what the Bible says. The reason for Jews' writing is because it has become critical. And these ungodly men are there to destroy our most holy faith. See, I ain't down there yet. 
So early on, he's talking about you got to contend for the faith. Because ungodly men in the last days come in tearing down things that are most precious. Our most holy faith. Tearing down what is holy and sacred. Watering it down like it ain't nothing. I come to tell us here tonight as I'm getting ready to close, holiness is still right. It may not be popular, but it is still right. What the Lord is calling for in the church, and see, this is not to everybody. And well, you got to understand how precise God gets in the last days. I'm right into those that are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. I'm making my appeal to all of you that are still trying to do right. I'm making my appeal to all of you that are serious about being saved. That we cannot be careless. We've got to become soldiers in the army of the Lord. And we've got to protect this faith to the point that we'll fight for it. Oh yeah, we got to fight against demonic spirits. We got to fight against devil doctrine. All of a sudden, you ain't got to be baptized in Jesus' name. I said amen, somebody. You don't have to be filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. You don't have to marry nobody in the church as long as they got a good job. Praise God. You ain't really got to be married. If you get along with somebody and y'all can just be supportive of each other after all, it's legal for two full-grown adults. What kind of men did you say had crept in the church? Ungodly. And ungodly men will cause you, if you allow them, to disregard what God's word said. Paul told the church that you got to beware of philosophy and vain deceit of men, which are after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So no wonder why in the visible church it's hard sometimes to tell the saint from the sinner. Why is that, Bishop? Because we got ungodly men That's right. who have crept in. Praise the Lord. So Jude says, you're going to have to contend for the faith because somebody in the last days still want to be saved. And there's got to be enough of God's people. Thank God in every dispensation, every age, God have always preserved him a people for his name. Praise the Lord. Now, y'all do me a favor right quick. Take both your hands and clap them together. Thank God for the word tonight. I'm not near through. Our most holy faith is precious. No price tag can be put on it. There are those that died for this faith. Many of us are in the church here today because somebody was serious enough about God. Talk back to me, somebody. Amen. They were serious enough about God. Yes. And if you like me, you ought to thank God they had, they had not watered it down so to where I can't get a grip on God. Amen. Thank God when I came along, Amen. holiness was made so solid that it gave me some do right power. Y'all hear what I'm saying in here. It gave me some stick to itiveness. Y'all have been in church. You know, that's those, those, those are terms we used to hear. Praise God. Some, some shown up. Pure OD. Holy Ghost. So, so brothers and sisters, uh, we are in danger of distinction. People are falling like flies. In the last days, 
And they're not falling because of some of the reasons that people think they are. It's because there have been ungodly men who have been invaded and they become agents of hell. Turning the grace of God. I'm, 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 I'm really wrapping this up here for tonight. We're going to continue, Lord willing, next week. Turning the grace of God. We're going to pick up there. Sister Amber, we're going to pick that up. There has been such an abuse of the meaning of grace that grace has become no more than a license to live like you want to live. Because God is a gracious God. God being my helper. Because the scripture said we got to contend for the faith that we're going to give us the word and the truth of the word. Even as it relates to grace. Grace is not just favor, 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 favor. But the grace of God Bible said to bring us salvation have appeared to all men. What does grace do? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly righteously in this present world. All right, so the Lord bless you. Heaven smile upon you. Y'all stay, keep Jew lodged in your storage. Because God said in the last days we're in danger of falling. You wait till we get in some of the next few verses. That's what happened with Israel. They took some things for granted and many of them failed. And so you and I don't want to fall. Oh, you got to love Jude. I feel like shouting right now before we get through it. All right, God bless you tonight. Let's prepare to receive.